Hello, welcome to Transporting Children with Disabilities, Conventional Restraint Options. Today's webinar is presented by the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems. And I'm Suzanne Ogaitis Jones, and I coordinate the Child Passenger Safety and Occupant Protection Healthcare Project. Um, this project is funded by the Maryland Highway Safety Office. We're in something like our 23rd year of funding for this, so we're happy to be offering these services and webinars to you. Um, Cindy Wright Johnson is the director of our, this project and for the EMS for Children program, and she will be our background. Uh, go-to webinar expert and um, handling questions as well, um, questions like technical questions or pulling up questions that might be for the speaker. Um, these are the goals for the webinar. I'm not going to read them to you because they've been kind of spelled out um, prior for you, but um, hopefully we will get to all of this and you will come away from this feeling like you've learned something and are um, have some good skills and knowledge to use in working with kids in car seats. So we have a quick poll and um, we're gonna initiate that and just wanna find out who's on today. It's like most of our participants are technicians in child passenger safety. I believe you could vote more than once. So we also have yeah. clinicians, transport specialists, parents, and child care providers. This will be saved. So if you need this information later, Suzanne can share it. I'm gonna hide it and go back to Suzanne's presentation. Okay, without further ado, I wanna introduce our speaker for today. Sarah Haverstick serves as the manager of safety advocacy Advocacy for Good Baby International, which is a company that includes Evenflow and Cybex car seat brands. And Sarah is um, working on her 16th year in child passenger safety. Um, she is a certified child passenger safety technician instructor and an instructor in the special needs um, safe transportation of children with special health care needs course. Um, she's held numerous positions on local, state, and national boards related to injury prevention, including she is a former chair of the National Child Passenger Safety Board and a current chair of the Manufacturers Alliance for Child Passenger Safety. In 2021, she was inducted into the Child Passenger Safety Hall of Fame, and Sarah received her bachelor's in political science from Rutgers University, and she lives in Florida. So we're very happy to have her tuning in to uh, speak to us here in Maryland. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm super excited to be here today um, and to chat about this topic in particular. Um, and as was mentioned, I love answering questions. So if you have any questions as we go, please type those into the chat or the q and um, happy to help chat about those as we go on. I'm going to obviously show some products and obviously, you know, I am a car seat manufacturer representative. So some of these products will be mine, but I tried to be really inclusive of some other brands in this too. Uh, so it's not meant to be just, you know, an even flow or Cybex show here, but certainly none of this is meant to be a product endorsement. I'm just trying to give some examples as we go. So specifically uh, for my part in this discussion, we're going to talk about transportation for children with disabilities. We're going to talk about key considerations when transporting kids. Um, and really, you know, the focus here is on conventional car seats. So we're going to really talk through features primarily of different types of conventional restraints and how those can work in different situations. Uh, just for background, so for any of the car seat technicians that are on the line, if you were not aware, there is additional training for car seat techs called the Safe Travel for All Children course. It was created by the Automotive Safety Program at Riley Hospital for Children, um, and it's designed to expand your knowledge as a car seat technician uh, involved in transporting kids with different medical conditions, disabilities, etc. So it's a two-day class. You have to be a car seat technician to attend the class. Uh, and, you know, it's a really small instructor pool, although it is thankfully growing again. Um, but I say that to say, you know, go to the website preventinjury.org if you've never taken this course before. Uh, if you ever see the course offered anywhere that's close enough for you to feasibly attend, and if this is a topic you are really interested in, I would encourage you to go whenever you have that opportunity, because it really is a great additional two days where we get into a lot of the adaptive equipment that is available. 
which is not what we're going to address today. But I like to bring that up um, when we talk about this topic so that you know that there are additional resources available. And then I've added this in, although it, it seems like you guys in Maryland are kind of already making some switch in terminology here. But, um, you know, I think we're going to see, as we do over time with lots of topics, a lot of terminology changes in this field. Um, first and foremost, always using person first terminology, um, but really thinking through how that the individual or the family that you're working with, how they prefer um, for you to address them or to address their child is really important. Um, so I think we'll see it nationally in some of our curricula, the way that we address this topic, which used to be transporting kids with special health care needs. Um, you know, we've seen that change to children with disabilities over the last year or so. And I think we'll see that reflected in some of our national curricula as well. So just wanted to mention that here in this presentation too. And as we start, you know, I, I like to just give a little bit of background in this. And, and unfortunately, you'll see, I only have a couple of research slides because there's really not a ton of research out there. And we're fortunate to have Riley Hospital for Children um, in Indiana. They have they run the National Center for the Safe Transportation of Kids. Um, there's they have done a lot of research in the past, and, and their two studies are two of those that I'm going to highlight today. Um, but I think there's hopefully maybe some room for some more research to happen in the future. Um, this study in particular, you know, it's a little bit older, was back in 2009 and should not be surprising to any of the Carson technicians on the line. They wanted to, the team at uh, Riley wanted to look at best practice recommendations versus what was actually happening with kids that were showing up at their facility in their vehicles. So they did an observational study. They looked at nearly 300 vehicles with nearly 300 children in them. Uh, and overall, what they found was that, you know, a good number of those drivers, 82% of them, chose the right type of car seat. So, you know, if they needed to be in an infant seat, they were in an infant seat. If it was appropriate for them to be in a forward-facing seat, they were in a forward-facing seat. So the overall type of the car seat was good. But not surprising, only 27% of them, so just over a quarter of those car seats were being used properly. And the thing, honestly, that's most surprising to me, having worked in this field in particular for a number of years, 24% of the car seats were inappropriately modified. I have seen that much, much higher in my practice working outpatient um, in our transportation clinic that I used to run at Vanderbilt. So only 24% seems pretty low in terms of modifications. 19% um, of those kids could have used some additional positioning support and only 8% of the medical equipment that was observed was actually properly secured. So just give all of that just to give kind of a baseline for, you know, where we are with with families and it, it doesn't feel much different than where we are with families across the board when we look at any of the car seat checks and the work that we do in the field. They also did a study specifically with children with autism spectrum disorder, um, again, coming into the Children's Hospital Transportation Clinic at Riley Children's Hospital. Uh, in talking with those families, you know, in, in terms of what they were seeing at clinic, almost three quarters of those kids were escaping their child safety restraint. That was the chief complaint from the family. And 20% of the children demonstrated aggressive or self-injurious behavior during travel. And I know, again, I came from Vanderbilt Children's before I started working um, for Evenflow and Cybex, and we ran an outpatient transportation clinic. And this was also a lot of what we saw um, with some of our uh, kiddos with autism, you know, some of this very aggressive behavior potentially, or just behavior like unbuckling not only themselves, but unbuckling another occupant. So if there was a sibling in a car seat, we saw a lot of concerns with families where siblings were then being unbuckled as well. So it, be, it creates a very dangerous situation for all of the occupants in the vehicle. And certainly this was seen in the research that the team at Riley did. So that's just a, you know, a quick little bit of background to kind of set the stage for where we are. But today we really wanna focus on conventional restraint options. And 
you know, for any of the non-technicians in the crowd, a conventional restraint is, you know, basically any car seat that you're going to purchase at retail, any local retailer like a Target or a Walmart, you can easily pick this car seat up off the shelf. It's designed to fit a wide range of children, and there's a really wide variety of options available. So obviously, I work, again, for Evenflow and for Cybex, and we are a conventional restraint manufacturer. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a car seat guide. It's posted at healthychildren.org. This is a great resource if you've never seen this or used it before. Um, they come directly to us as car seat manufacturers to help populate this guide every year. And they basically just give a listing of every current car seat model and they break it down by category. So infant car seats, convertible seats, all-in-ones, et cetera, um, and give you some really basic specs about the product. And then there's a couple of additional questions that get asked that we'll go over as, as we go through this. But I've used that to help build out a little bit of some of the content in this presentation because I think it's an interesting glimpse into what is happening across the field. Uh, and right now, as of the 2023 list, and you know, this is me counting, so there's always a chance I'm off by a couple of numbers here, but I counted 254 different car seat models. It's a lot of different car seats, which, you know, putting on my advocacy hat, thinking of that brand new parent that doesn't know what they're doing and what they're looking for, that can contribute to how overwhelming it can be to working and, and selecting a car seat. But you know, thinking of being a technician and an instructor and working with a wide variety of families and children, I love seeing that really high number because it means there's hopefully an option that can work for anybody's situation. So it means, you know, might be overwhelming if you're not as familiar with car seats, but for me, it's a really positive thing that we do have so many different options at so many different price points. And, you know, we want to target conventional restraints first uh, for a lot of reasons. They're so much easier to purchase than going down the adaptive equipment side. They're typically available immediately. So if you walk into that Walmart, you see it on the shelf, you can walk right out the door with it. Uh, they are definitely less expensive than the adaptive restraints. Generally, an easier, you know, it, it's a very subjective word, but they're generally easier to use and typically because they're just generally a little bit more familiar. When we get into the adaptive equipment, there's sometimes different types of belt hats and routing that needs to happen that doesn't look and feel like what we're used to seeing with conventional car seats. So often, you know, these conventional seats, you know, that it just feels a little bit more familiar to that family. They are often a little bit smaller and lighter weight, so it can be easier to get them in and out of the vehicle. Anybody on the line that's worked with an adaptive restraint knows some of those products are quite big, quite large and heavy. And literally, we would take them out in our clinic. Um, we would go always out to the vehicle before we made a decision on that car seat because there were certain situations where we could not fit, literally could not fit a car seat into the back seat of the vehicle. Uh, so conventional restraints, generally that's not gonna be an option. And we can use conventional restraints for a lot of kids. And in most situations, a conventional restraint will work for many children with different disabilities. So uh, if the child is smaller in stature or a little bit lighter weight and, and 65 pounds is you know, a really key indicator since um, that's typically where a harness is going to max with a conventional restraint. So if they're a little bit smaller and can still fit in the conventional restraint, it's generally going to be a really nice option for them for that time. Uh, extended rear facing, your only options are conventional restraints. There aren't adaptive medical equipment restraints that can really work in that extended rear facing. So if that's going to be what benefits that child, this is going to be your only opportunity to do that. Uh, booster seats, we have lots and lots of boosters on the market, and we're going to go through those in a little bit. Uh, so if a child has, you know, enough trunk control that they can sit appropriately in that booster seat, it's a really great option for them as well. And conventional restraints can be, you know, an interim option. So you know that long term, this might not be the solution for this child and this family, 
But in the short term, we need something to bridge the gap while we're ordering the medical equipment and conventional restraints can play a nice role right there too. Uh, and then when we're thinking about, you know, how do we determine what is the right car seat for a child with disabilities, we think about the same things that we think for any children. We need to know their weight, their height, their age. We want to know about their behavior or any maturity concerns. Uh, we want to know about what that car seat requires. So the minimum and maximum, you know, weight and height limits, we wanna make sure those are all gonna line up together. We certainly wanna know about the family's vehicle and any other occupants in the vehicle, what we need to work around specifically, uh, just like we would in any car seat situation. And then in general, you know, you also want to know, like, what's the medical condition? Is there equipment that that child needs to, to transport with? But, you know, I'll say from the beginning, you know, and, and Suzanne read a little bit of my background. I'm, I do not have a clinical background. I learned so much working with the OT and PT teams at Vanderbilt as we were developing and working through our transportation clinic. Um, but hearing a medical condition is not always super helpful to me. It's not the thing that like immediately is going to tell me what's going on with this family. So at least for me as a non-clinical provider working in this transportation space, I found that it's a lot more helpful to ask some key questions so that you can better understand what those transportation needs are. So, you know, in no particular order, questions that I like to ask, you know, can that child sit upright unassisted? That's going to tell you a lot about their torso control um, and what might work for them, depending on, you know, what their age is. Can they transfer into the vehicle unassisted? Or is this, you know, caregiver lifting up 40 pounds of weight and transferring that on their own? That's going to help you think through what kind of car seat is going to work too. If the child can transfer a little bit, you've got a little bit more space to work. If that child is completely dependent on the caregiver for transfer in and out of the vehicle, I want to be thinking about what's realistic for that caregiver. And maybe I need a car seat with lower sides or something that can rotate which we'll talk about in a little bit. Airway, you know, I think is always really the number one concern. Are there concerns about the child's airway? Do we need to be thinking about how to help protect that airway during transportation? If the child can't breathe, everything else is basically a moot point. So you always want to make sure we understand, you know, going along with that torso support and how well that child can help hold up and position their head, what kinds of other positioning might we need to be thinking about in that car seat? Always useful to know what's currently happening in the car, um, how are they currently behaving, and specifically, what are that family's concerns? Why are they seeking you out as a car seat technician or in your clinical role otherwise? How, what is the need that the family is seeing? Because at the end of the day, I'm not the one in the vehicle with this child. Uh, the family is. They're the experts on what's happening with their kiddo. Uh, do they need to travel with any medical equipment? Unfortunately, you know, and, and we'll, we go through this in the safe travel course, there really aren't a lot of good answers for medical equipment. It's kind of a do the best you can to prevent this equipment from being a projectile situation but it's still important for you to know and understand so that you can help think through what does it mean to hopefully not be a projectile. Hanging a piece of equipment off of a vehicle headrest, probably not a good idea, um, but the, the families typically don't know that. You're the transportation expert. You're the one thinking through all of these very specific transportation concerns, and they are often not something the family was thinking about. The family was thinking about, you know, kind of ease of use and making things work with what they have. And again, you know, this one I really think is the most important, you know, I try to be a listener here. What are your concerns as that caregiver? How can I help you address what you're seeing in that car? Uh, so just kind of a broad overview for how I have sort of set up this presentation. We're going to go through each type, like category of car seats, starting with the rear facing only and then going all the way through booster seats. 
uh, for CARSI technicians on the line, you know, I know you know all of these things, but my goal is to talk a little bit broadly about specific features in each of these categories that could be useful in these scenarios. So starting again with that rear facing only or infant car seat, these can be great for premature or low birth weight infants. Often the big benefit here is that an infant car seat really is designed just for an infant. It is only meant to be used by this baby from birth until they get a little bit bigger, but it doesn't have to hold this really big toddler forward facing kind of aged kid. So generally the harness has slightly smaller harness dimensions meant to fit just that infant in the seat. Uh, these products can be very portable. That infant carrier has a handle, makes it easy to transport, might be easier to get back and forth between medical appointments. <clears throat> Challenges on the infant car seat side is, you know, you want to make sure you get proper positioning and fit. And we'll talk a little bit about infant inserts and head restraints. And you might have to be critical about some of these things. Um, no rethread harnesses can sometimes be, again, along the line of those infant, infant inserts. Um, no rethread harnesses can sometimes make positioning a little bit of a challenge. Uh, and then casted fit as well. So if you've got a child who's going to be casted, we're going to talk about spike at towards the end of the presentation. Sometimes infant car seats, just because they are a little bit smaller, they don't work as well for infants that are also going to be casted. Uh, so obviously this is an infant car seat generally categorized by a car seat carrier and a base, although some come without that base. Uh, overall, you're looking for harness options. So you want a lower bottom harness slot uh, so that you can fit that very tiny infant. So typically you want that lowest harness slot to be somewhere between four to six inches. Um, that'll give you an idea that it should work for a lot of those really small infants, but you want to see some adjustment options there. Uh, on the buckle, again, looking and being critical, how close is that buckle? You want to see something that's nice and small if you're trying to work with a really tiny infant. But then also some car seats will allow you to shorten that buckle. And that helps, again, to better fit that really small infant. Um, and we'll talk about that. I have some pictures of that in a couple of slides. Head and body pillows, you know, be critical about these things. And one does not guarantee fit for all. So uh, there's many, many different styles out there. You obviously always need to check and see what that car seat manufacturer requires for use. Sometimes they're weight limited, sometimes they're age limited, like you can use it up till three months old, et cetera. Uh, so you wanna check and understand how that manufacturer allows the use, but also recognize that if possible, removing a head pillow can often help a lot with positioning, especially for tiny infants. And I talked about airway before and airway being such a critical thing to talk about. These teeny tiny little three and four pound infants have a very, very small airway. So just even the tiniest bit of padding behind the head might be enough to push the head forward and compromise that airway. So taking out that head insert can sometimes help there as well. Harness covers, the same, you know, there aren't any harness covers in this picture, uh, but if you have a product with harness covers, sometimes, especially for a small infant, it helps to take them off. Uh, you'll get a better fit at the chest clip, and then you can always tell the family they can put them back on later as the child grows. So I often have families like stick it in a little plastic bag, write the car seat name, you know, on the bag so you know what it came from, and then you can always add that back in. And then I mentioned earlier, like one of the key defining characteristics of this rear-facing only car seat is it's got the removable base that's going to potentially help you get that recline adjustment, which will again help you with that airway. Um, but really, you know, thinking usability for a family and especially a family that might have to go back and forth with a lot of medical appointments, it's nice to have this flexibility with that infant car seat where you're not having to reinstall it all the time. You can take it easily on and off that base. You can pair it with a stroller to get in and out of doctor's appointments potentially. On the buckle side, so again, look for adjustability with that buckle and look for options where you can potentially shorten that buckle. So shortening the buckle not only, you know, makes it a smaller distance at the buckle, but it's also going to improve fit in that like upper thigh hip area for the infant too. 
So generally shortening the buckle means instead of just taking that buckle straight down and having the anchor plate vest on the bottom of the shell of the infant car seat, you kind of make it a J loop. So you take that anchor plate and you loop it up to one of the other harness position or buckle positions in front of the buckle. So now instead of having the anchor at the bottom of the seat, the anchor ends up inside that car seat underneath the seating surface where the child is seated. Sometimes this is weight limited too. So as you can see on the screen here, um, with the light max, we say you can only use that shortened position for an infant that weighs less than eight pounds. Harness adjustments. There's lots of car seats that offer different adjustments at the hip or waist area. Uh, again, follow the manufacturer guidance and instructions about how to make these adjustments. Oftentimes when car seats are shipped, they're shipped for the average size newborn, especially these infant car seats. We're shipping it in a configuration where we think most consumers are going to want to and need to use the product. So often if you are working with a smaller infant, it means you'll have an option potentially to bring that harness in even a little closer than where it is out of the box. We get lots of questions as manufacturers about crotch rolls and rolling up receiving blankets to the side of the infant. Uh, this was a really hot topic a number of years ago. So a lot of our brands wrote FAQs as a result because this is sometimes what you'll find in product instructions, but not always covered in product instructions. So often on our FAQ pages, we're able to address some of these more technical questions that really specifically come up from car seat technicians and might not be as common with the general public. So you can see examples here, you know, I'm not going to get into who allows what and when, just know that generally a lot of brands are going to have information available to you. It might be in that FAQ. Uh, this in particular, though, sometimes brands are going to tell you no. So both Graco and Evenflow and RFAQs, we had said on the previous page that it's okay to use these additional positioning supports. But this is an example of a brand with the Upper Baby Mesa infant car seat that they say, no, you cannot add um, a crotch roll around the buckle or any blankets towards the side of that infant. So important to know, you know, what each brand says. And then three pound infants, you know, this is something that I think you might start to see more in the future because at least what we've been hearing from our clinical partners in the field is that more and more infants are ready to go home under four pounds. So it, it reminds me of where we were probably 15 or so years ago with infant car seats and most infant seats were at five pounds. And then we heard from the field that there was really this need to be down to four pounds, that babies were ready to go home. And now you see that basically all infant car seats on the market start at four pounds, or at least the vast majority of them do. So now we're in this place where now we can have kids smaller than that going home, which is really medical science miracles over here. Um, so for Evenflow, we did some work. We have approved our light max and safe max infant car seats. Even though they're labeled at four pounds, we allow you to use them at three pounds and 15.75 inches. The information on screen here comes directly from an FAQ on our website. And if any of the folks on the line are hospital partners, I can also customize a letter to your hospital with this information as well. Uh, after that, the Summer Infant came out with the Affirm 335, and the three in that name starts at three pounds. So this product was labeled at three pounds and 15 inches, as you can see. Unfortunately, it was discontinued towards the end of 2021. Um, I say that to say you probably can't buy it new and find it in too many places right now, but because most infant seats have that six year expiration, you may still see this coming through, you know, a hospital or out in the field. And then we just launched a new infant car seat for Evenflow called the Shift Dual Ride Infant Car Seat and Stroller Combo. And this three pound piece was really important to us because we'd been through this project with Lightmax. And we said from the beginning, we wanted to make sure this seat was going to fit these very small infants and that it was labeled as such from the beginning. So you can see here, 
the product on product in instructions. It's labeled at three pounds and 15.7 inches. We labeled the infant insert, which is required from three to six pounds. So there's a label on there that says you have to use it from three to six pounds. After that, the infant insert is optional because these things are there, you know, for comfort and for positioning fit. But we also gave a checklist for our premature or low birth weight infant use families to make sure they felt comfortable with just the basics of infant car seat use. And we put all of that information into a video format as well. So I think you might start to see some more brands. And certainly if this is an area that you work, I would use your voice as a technician to share. If this is something that you think we really need to see in the field, it's important for other brands to hear that information too. Uh, so then moving on to our next category of car seats, so lumping in the big convertibles and all-in-ones together, uh, these can be really great for lots and lots of kids in different situations, whether that's low tone, poor head control, any respiratory airway concerns, achondroplasia, hydrocephalus, encephalocele, like we could name lots and lots of different ways that this type of car seat could benefit a child. The biggest benefit that I see here is extended rear facing, because as I mentioned at the beginning, there really aren't any adaptive restraints that cover this extended rear facing idea. And happily, we have tons of options on the conventional restraint market now. Challenges here, you know, fits a child, does it provide enough support, does it do, you know, what we need to do for that child, and certainly depending on that product transfer into vehicle, um, depending on how high those sides are or what else might be happening, that can be a difficult thing. So really basic convertible car seat on screen here, again, looking at lots of adjustment options and depending on who you need to use this for or what that child's growth trajectory is or how long you are expecting if this is just something you're using as an interim restraint or if this is something that's going to help this child long term you know think through those harness heights and certainly if you want this th this to be a seat that's going to last for this child for a longer period of time i'd be looking for a top harness slot that's at least 18 inches from you know seat pan up to that top harness opening Buckle, again, look for different adjustments, look for options, and even here you might find some options to shorten that buckle like we talked about with infant seats. There are some convertible seats that allow that too. Same situation with head and body pillows. If you are using this with a smaller infant, just be aware still that that head pillow might need to come out if that's allowed. Harness covers, same deal. You know, again, if we're working with a smaller infant, they may get in the way. You also want to understand if that harness cover is required from the car seat manufacturer. And in some situations, it might be. Uh, so that's an important piece to call out in product instructions. And then generally, you know, the nice thing about these convertibles and all-in-ones is they're just a bit bigger. So the seat pan is a little bit wider. So if we're working with a casted infant, that can be helpful there. Uh, the seat back is certainly longer, so that's where we're going to be able to keep these kiddos in that rear-facing position longer. Uh, and then be critical of things like padding. How much padding is there? Is that padding likely to break down over time? Because certainly, you know, the inability of a child to move and like kind of shift their weight in a five-point harness is certainly something that should be top of mind when working with kids with different disabilities. Uh, infant inserts, again, you know, think through what inserts are going to work well for that family if it's possible for them to go and test things out and, you know, just go and touch and feel product on shelf. Uh, certainly, there's different inserts for different things. Uh, on the left, this is actually an infant insert, but I pulled it in here just for this infant or for the discussion about inserts. Uh, but some manufacturers might sell an aftermarket accessory that you can purchase to use. Uh, the one on the left, I would say, is probably really a lot more for comfort, doesn't have a whole lot of additional padding. So probably if you're looking for something that's really going to help support the torso or keep that child more midline in the seat, might not be your best option. On the right, uh, CLEC also has this infant thingy that allows you to use their convertible car seats to a lower weight for smaller children. But it's a little bit more robust with, you know, that amount of side and lateral padding. So that could be an option that might work well for some kids, too. So, again, that ability to touch, feel, and be a little bit critical about what you're looking for can be helpful. 
there's so many options for extended rear facing. I almost didn't like attempt to write them. So I might have missed one or two, but lots of options that go rear facing to 50 pounds. I didn't even bother putting there's a few on the market that go to 45 pounds. Either way, there's options and lots of different types of seats that might work for different situations with kids. So you can look at something, you know, that might rotate. You can look at like the extent of fit that's going to give you some more leg room. So if that child needs a little bit more space, um, maybe they're casted and, you know, you need to get them a little further from that seat back and extent of fit kind of product would be really good for something like that too. So you have a lot of different scenarios and a lot of different options and ways to keep kiddos rear facing longer. The only other thing that I'll add to that that I didn't put a slide in about is that I also think it's really important to listen to the family and what their concerns are. Um, for some kiddos, especially kids that might have, you know, a seizure disorder and um, might be prone to seizures in the vehicle in particular, I've worked with a lot of families that while rear facing might have been a little bit more beneficial for positioning for the child, the family was so concerned about needing to see or access and be able to help that child if something happened in the vehicle that it just wasn't feasible for them to stay rear facing. And my role is just to present the options and to give that family kind of the pros and cons in each situation and then let them think through what's really going to work the best for them. So staying rear facing until forever is not going to be the best option for every family. So in that case, you know, we work to find seats that could be supportive forward facing that could provide a lot of recline forward facing um, to help support those needs and those concerns. Uh, higher weight harness for forward facing, there's no options. You know, 65 pounds is your max across the board for all car seats on the conventional market. So if you need to go above 65 pounds, you're going to need to start to look into the adaptive restraint market. But there are some higher height limits for forward facing. So most seats max at 49 or 50 inches, but there's a handful of car seats that will take you above that in harness mode, which I think is really helpful to know and understand. You could have a really long skinny kid and it's nice to know that there's some options that might give you some a little bit more time in that harness if that's what you need. Forward facing recline, I mentioned, you know, in that seizure example, but Forward facing recline is something on the AAP list. So they do for any seat that has a forward facing mode, we have to answer a yes or no question about whether or not we offer any recline. And you can see on screen, just over half of the convertibles offer some forward facing recline and almost three quarters of the all in ones. I think forward facing recline in the convertibles and the all in ones, it gives you a nice amount of recline. So again, it's going to be product specific. It's also going to be a bit vehicle dependent, how much that's really going to impact that um, the amount of recline you get is going to be dependent on what that vehicle seat geometry looks like, but it gives you some options. Some brands will have a actual forward facing recline range. So you need to actually end up within that range. And you know, some might have things on the left with the Symphony, we have it weight limited. You can only use that intermediate recline if the child weighs less than 40 pounds. Uh, and then on the right with the Sonus, it's a really basic seat, but if you, you know, dive into the instructions, we give you some additional, you know, flip foot kind of information for how you can kind of change how that product might sit in the vehicle. And in some cases, you know, the Graco Forever has a really specific note, like in this weight range, you have to use a specific recline position. So it's really important to understand looking in the product manual, really understand what these car seats require. Uh, the Britax click tights, they give you again, that recline range. I've seen lots of commentary on this because, you know, there's a lot of overlapping colors here. So make sure you go to the product instructions so you understand where that recline ball can be placed and specifically what they're looking for there. Then, you know, in with these convertibles and all-in-ones, there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening on the market right now. There is a lot happening with transfer into the vehicle and with these rotating car seats. So rotating car seats can be super helpful for those children I mentioned earlier that cannot assist with transfer. 
40 pounds is an awful lot of weight to pick up and move if that child isn't able to help with that transfer in any way. Uh, so thinking really critically about how we can help that caregiver so that that caregiver is supported is important and rotating seats can be really beneficial there. They can also help caregivers that have their own disabilities, their own strengths or mobility considerations might help them have a little bit more independence and a little more flexibility in getting the child in and out of the vehicle. Uh, these car seats, though, are generally are heavy. So, you know, cons to these rotating seats, they are all generally very heavy. They are all a little bit more expensive. There's a lot going on, a lot of mechanism there. Uh, and potentially for some of them, the child specs and, you know, the ability to use them, uh, sometimes they have some lower specs depending on how that product was designed. But look at this. I mean, we have so many options on the market right now. So again, I think this is great. It means that you can be critical. You can look to see what fits in your price range, what offers you the amount of padding that you need, what gives you the support that you think is going to be useful. And there's lots of them out there. Uh, then combination car seats. So, you know, this category, unlike the all-in-ones that get all of the love, this category doesn't get a whole lot of love. So same kind of group of kids, lots, it can really be a big benefit for some kids. I think the biggest benefit with a combination seat in comparison to those convertibles and all-in-ones is the lower profile transfer into the vehicle. So generally that combination seat is going to sit a little bit lower than the bigger all-in-ones. Um, I don't think while we're going to talk about forward-facing recline, I don't think you get quite as much recline with combination seats as you might with those convertibles and all-in-ones. So same things here for time. I'm gonna, you know, skip through most of this, but all of those things that we talked about with convertibles and all-in-ones, harness covers, head and body pillows, et cetera, all of that still comes into play with these combination seats. And unfortunately still, you don't get any options over 65 pounds in the harness. But you only have also then one option. I told you this category gets no love. Uh, the Kiko MyFit is the only car seat that harnesses above 50 inches um, as this combination seat, but it is an option and it does have a very nice headrest adjust. So it is quite a bit taller, uh, so can work well for some of those kiddos or could be a good interim restraint option. Uh, as I mentioned, the recline, there's definitely options. More than half of the combination seats on the market give you some kind of option for forward-facing recline. In my experience, that recline is really more to help with fit to vehicle and a lot less about providing any significant amount of recline for the child in the seat. And then just finally on the seats, we've got booster seats, which are really my favorite thing to talk about. These can be so great for any kids that are shorter stature, you know, achondroplasia being one of the big diagnoses there, um, but they're really age appropriate. So if the child has enough torso support, a booster seat is a really great option. And, you know, boosters are generally pretty basic, but there's things you can be looking for. You want to make sure that headrest can adjust tall enough to give you the adequate amount of support for their growth. There's some cool options that I'm going to show you that give you some adjustability in the shoulder and the hips, which is useful. You know, you want to get kids to buy into being in the booster so you can find cool fabrics, things, let the child help pick out the seat that'll help buy them in on using the product. Uh, and then be critical about the hip width in particular. So depending on the child who's using the seat, you know, look for something that's going to give you a little bit more room back there at the hips too. Uh, for most boosters, they max at 57 inches, which is four feet, nine inches tall. But we all know that that's not really a magic number and that not all kids are guaranteed to fit the vehicle seatbelt at four foot, nine inches tall. So there are a lot of other options. You can see anywhere from 60 to 63 inches that give you the ability to find something that you could use a little bit longer for that child's growth. I love, love this booster. Um, this is the Diono Monterey. It's got this um, little thing, a, a mechanism on the back where you can actually independently um, make those side wings a little bit wider. And then also you can raise and lower that headrest. So you can really help to customize the fit. I've worked with a number of kids with achondroplasia. This was a really great option for a lot of those kiddos because it gave them a little bit of that space in the shoulders that they needed. 
uh, Cybex from our brand, we also have a booster that's similar. Uh, it goes up and out at the same time. You can't adjust it independently, so you don't have quite as much flexibility there, but it does get a little bit wider as it gets taller. Uh, and then last but not least, you know, and I mentioned 65 pounds is the max of what you get with a traditional harness car seat, but we do also have the Ride Safer Travel Vest. For some kiddos, that could potentially be an option, and you can use it from 80, like the large size, from 80 to 110 pounds. There are four different sizes available with this. They come with a crotch strap and with a tether, the Gen 5. Um, so it gives you a little bit of flexibility too. If this is what might work for that child, this could be an option as well, and at least gets you over that 65 pound mark. Uh, other things to think about that, you know, we've kind of touched on a little about about this, but, you know, cacti kids, kids and spikas, uh, it can be really difficult. You want something that's got a wider side or wider seat pan and lower sides. Uh, a little bit of recline forward facing could be helpful. I mentioned the extent of it as, you know, giving you a little bit more space for rear facing. But, you know, this is another one of those scenarios where it's important to remember that sometimes you have to do things that aren't exactly best practice. And that good, better, best comes into play when you've got a kiddo in a cast, you can't always fit them rear facing. So as long as they are appropriate and meet the specs to turn forward facing, that might have to be the option for the time that they're casted. Uh, always contact the manufacturer if you are wondering if this special consideration, like if I could do this, we do have a spike of cast letter for even flow where we basically say, as long as you don't do anything different to, you know, make the fit of this child work for this, uh, and their weight is within, their casted weight is within our weight limits, we're totally fine with you using our products. There's some other brands who have specifically said, no, we don't want you using a casted um, seat or a casted child in one of our seats. So. Uh, always reach out to the manufacturer for those. Halo in particular can be a little bit challenging because uh, you need to thread the harness webbing through the halo device because you want to make sure it's sitting on those shoulders for the child. So ideally, we want to keep kids rear facing. It would be awesome if they're small enough and young enough that we can still get them into a rear facing car seat and they still have that head clearance a wider opening at the top of the car seat can help and just being rear facing makes this a lot easier specifically rear facing with a very traditional manual rethread harness where you can easily at the back of the seat grab the splitter plate and take the harness straps on and off and then we often hear about our little escape artist friends uh, this is probably in terms of questions about kids um, this is one of the most common questions that I get from our customer service team with people calling. Um, the number one thing here is education. You know, we know as technicians, often car seats are not used the right way. We know there's a lot of misuse with harnessing. So that's the first thing to check. Is the child harness, is the harness coming at the right position at the shoulders? Is it tight enough? Is the chest clip in the right position? Because, you know, not doing all of those things can make it a lot easier for the child to get out of the seat. So helping with some of that basic education can be the first thing. Then it's, you know, talking about how for most kids, this is just a phase. They figured something out. They're getting a reaction from you. So how do we respond? How can we help support that child? I often suggest to our customer service team that, you know, we have the families let them, let the child help uh buckle and unbuckle themselves at the right time and provide tons of that praise when they're doing it the right way at the right moment um so that way maybe they're not going to be as interested to do it during travel uh but you also might want to try different chest clip styles and specifically anecdotally uh, excuse me anecdotally i have heard that this magnetic chest clip in particular is a little bit more difficult to open. Uh, so you might want to experiment and have, again, the family go to the store, check things out on the shelf and see what might be easier or more difficult for their child. And again, what works for one child might not necessarily work for another. And then I just wanted to close out with a little bit of information, you know, from our brands about what we're doing. This is certainly a topic that has been really meaningful and important to me throughout my child passenger safety career. And I feel really fortunate that our brands are 
also aligned and feel like, you know, helping improve the transportation for one child is important and we should do that. So we do have a medical waiver program. So if you reach out to me, you're working with a specific child in a specific situation and you're using one of our products and you're like, gosh, if I could only just add a little bit of pad in here or change something over here or use this convertible car seat above the stated height limit because I'm trying to fit this kiddo in a halo rear facing a little bit longer, let me know you know, reach out to me, send me an email, give me some pictures, give me some description. And if we can all come to an agreement on a modification, we're happy to have the discussion. And then we would have the family sign the medical waiver because we're allowing them to do something outside of the stated use of the product. Um, I can't always say yes to everything, but it's something that we think is really important to do and to provide for families. So I just wanted to share a few examples of some of the things we have done. Um, we've worked really closely with Children's Wisconsin. They do a very specific bladder extra fee surgery. For most of these kids, it happens between you know two and four months old. Uh, the very first picture they ever sent me is the one on the left. They are using an even flow seat. They had bunched up some stuff underneath the baby and asked us if that was okay. And we said, nope, we don't really like that at all. Uh, so then we started working with them and we started to design and develop an insert um, that you can see in the center as we were in development with, you know, what this insert might possibly look like. Uh, and then you can see it with one of their kiddos on the right hand side, uh, certainly better positioning than the kiddo on the left. Um, this is a really specific project and a really specific uh, age and size that this hospital works with. But my hope is that, you know, in the future, we can be looking at how could we apply this to other kiddos in like other spica casts because essentially after surgery, uh, post-op, they're in basically a spica cast. So how else can we help support the field there? Uh, recently, I had a hospital reach out that had a child that had no lower extremities. So again, they were trying to use an even flow infant car seat. Uh, they were trying to figure out how best to position the infant in the car seat. Um, the initial pictures they sent me really weren't ideal. So talking with our engineering team, uh, using my little huggable preemie doll, we were able to come up with this little idea of, of how to fold some blankets around the child just to beef up the area at the hips so that they could be better supported inside of that harness. So this was certainly a special case scenario. Um, we've worked with a number of kids with gibbous deformities. So needing some pressure relief around the spinal area. Um, we've agreed and we've worked with a, a few different facilities using some really specific foam to make kind of a foam situation like what you're seeing there um, to kind of support the backside of that child and take some release, relief and some pressure off of that gibbous. Um, the, one of the very first kiddos we worked with on this was at Cincinnati Children's and they did a nice little write up about the program. And, and this is really the why. This is why we take the time to have the conversations uh, Finley's mom said in just the two years that she had been on the earth, all she wanted to do was take this child to the beach, but she really couldn't do that drive with her. She knew she was so uncomfortable in the car seat and we were able to work with her on these modifications. And now she feels like she can do those things with her child. And that's what's really at the end of the day, making life better for that one kid is really, really important. Uh, so this is my contact information. Happy to help answer any questions. I could not see the chat at all during this, so I'm not sure if there's any questions, but happy to answer those now. Thank you, Sarah. All very good information. You do such a great job at explaining it kind of from, you know, the basics to pulling in the behavioral stuff, the physical stuff, the considerations just on the parent or caregiver side of things. Just a really wonderful presentation. I think lots of very helpful stuff there. Okay, so while the questions are coming in or you're formulating your question, I just want to mention there are some handouts that are available through GoToWebinar. Um, in Maryland, we do have um, some information about getting Medicaid coverage for special seats. Um, so that's included. Um, also, some information about the next two sessions related to safe transport of children with disabilities. The flyer is 
included. And um, again, while we're waiting for questions and comments, uh, remember that this webinar does qualify you for one CEU for your recertification as a child passenger safety technician. The question is, are the spica cast inserts available for purchase we do a lot of work with kids and are nervous because many of the seats we use expire soon uh so unfortunately no they're not yet um this again was a really specific project with a really limited size of child that we were working with with Wisconsin so it works really well for what they need but I don't think it's guaranteed to work really well for every kid in the spica at this point um, but it is something that I have certainly discussed with engineering I have uh, bi-weekly test scenario meetings with our engineering team so that I can talk about the things that I would like to see us doing um, and the things that I'd like to see some crash testing around so that we could do some of these bigger projects. So that one is definitely on the list. Engineering has some ideas. Um, I'm hopeful that maybe in the near future, but if this is a population that you work with a lot, I would love for you to email me. I'm trying to keep a list of folks that when we do get to that point, um, we'll probably need to pilot some fits with whatever it is we get to. I probably will send out some kind of a uh, form where I'd like people to give me some feedback on who you see, how often you see kids, what their, what are their ages and sizes, etc. Um, so if you are interested in helping to contribute to moving this project forward, I would love for you to email me so I can add you to that list. Great, that's that sounds wonderful. I, I know a couple of people who are going to be very interested in that. We have a number of comments that are saying, thank you, great information, I will send an email. I wanted to note, um, Sarah mentioned families can go to stores to try out some of these seats um, to see if, if they're going to have the features that would work with their particular kid. And um, another option, if you contact in Maryland, Maryland Kids and Safety Seats, um, they have a lot of car seats and, you know, you could probably borrow one of their seats or work with them curbside to try out some of these to see if they might work for you. And then you would go and purchase the seat that you want because they're the training seats. But we really have been trying to um, have a bunch of seats for families to try out in cases, um, not just the conventional seats, but um, some of the uh, seats for children with disabilities, the adaptive seats as well that people can try out and then go on and order the ones they need. So um, do reach out um, either to myself at MIMS or to Maryland Kids and Safety Seats. Well, thank you. It's been great. I'm really glad we got to have this conversation today. Yes, thank you, Sarah. And um, we'll be in touch with you and uh, we will have this archived as Cindy said. So everyone have a great weekend and travel safely.